Good afternoon. I'm Doug Cox, and on behalf of the Federalist Society, welcome to our September luncheon. Today's event is sponsored by the Society's practice groups, the DC Lawyers Chapter, and the Faculty Division. Our program today is a little different from the regular lunches that take place down in Chinatown. For example, there's no Kung Po on the menu. <laughs> but some things are more important than Chinese food, no matter how yummy. The new Supreme Court term promises to be one of those very important things. So we have pulled together an all-star panel of experts to give us their thoughts and insights. Our moderator today is Pete Williams, the NBC News Justice Correspondent. Among his many other accomplishments, Pete is well known for being one of the first journalists along with his colleague Dan Abrams, to get the reporting right on that long ago December evening when the decision came down in Bush versus Gore. We're grateful he's here with us today to lead the discussion. Pete. Thanks very much, and good day to all of you. Each of our panelists has a set of cases to preview, so I'll briefly introduce each one as they speak, but you have full bios. Playboy magazine has just declared the University of Virginia America's top party school. But if it was like that when Ken Weinstein graduated from UVA, he has spent his career making up for it by getting very serious. For the record, I don't know who was a party school. <laughs> I was in a library the whole time. Federal, <laughs> federal prosecutor in New York, U.S. attorney in Washington, chief of staff to FBI director Robert Mueller. In 2006, he became the first Justice Department lawyer to fill a brand new position, assistant attorney general for national security. He then served as the Homeland Security Advisor to President George W. Bush and is now in private practice in Washington. Ken, please. I always found it dangerous to be on a panel that starts off with a reference to Playboy magazine, um, but uh, I'll see if I can cast my breath and go forward. Uh, thanks very much, Pete, and good to be here. I've been asked to talk about three cases. One is a, I guess you could call a national security case, and then two sort of more regular Fourth Amendment criminal cases. Let me start with the national security case, and that is called Clapper versus Amnesty International. It's actually a standing case, um, but it's a standing case relating to a, um, a challenge to what's called the FISA Amendments Act. The FISA Amendments Act was passed in 2008, uh, and it, it was an amendment of a very substantial amendment of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that was passed in 1978. And to understand the standing issue and the stakes at play here, you have to understand the merits a little bit, so let me get into it. Just for a second, for those watching on C-SPAN, what is standing? Standing is the question of whether a party actually has the right to appear in court uh, and to challenge, uh, to make, in this case, to challenge the statute. Um, just to get ahead of things, the plaintiffs here are um, attorneys, human rights activists, and others who are in regular contact with people overseas in particular people who might well be the subject of electronic surveillance by the federal government, and they are challenging the law that allows this electronic surveillance, this wiretapping, because they are concerned that their communication is going to get picked up. They're claiming that they have standing to challenge this law because even though the, the surveillance might be directed at the people overseas that they're talking to, that their communication is going to get picked up in the course of that surveillance, and so therefore they have the right to challenge it in court. So that's the standing issue that we're dealing with. The... Um, but just to get to the merits just a little, uh, for a minute, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act passed in 1978 in the aftermath of the exposés of the mid-'70s about various abuses in the intelligence community. And it, in short, it set up a system by which the executive branch would have to go to this court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court here in D.C., and get permission when they wanted to do wiretapping for national security purposes to get foreign intelligence information. This is a way of making sure that the court, there was a court that actually had a check uh, and a role in reviewing the government's efforts to do this national security wiretapping, which had been abused in the past when there hadn't been a court, uh, any court role. Uh, the problem with the statute as it was designed back in 1978 is that it, Congress tried to limit it so that it focused on communications inside the United States. And it was designed in a way that didn't require going to the court if the government, the National Security uh, Agency or others, were trying to wiretap people outside the United States. The problem is that by trying to, in defining the parameters of what, what communications require, or what surveillances required court approval and which ones didn't, the statute referred to the technology at the time. Those, those communications that were wire, those communications that were radio uh, or you know, satellite technology. The problem is that since 1978, we've seen a dramatic change in the technology, 
uh, of communications, in particular fiber, fiber optic cables all over the world, which has actually very much changed the routing of communications and has changed the requirement, the court order requirement that the government faces in, in, when they try to get um, do this electronic surveillance. And the result of that is that um, leading up to 9-11, there are many instances where the government would actually have to go to the FISA court to get an order from the FISA court before they could electronically surveil or wiretap somebody who was overseas. And that was not the intent of FISA originally. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, um, uh, Amendments Act, the, the FISA Amendments Act of 2008 was meant to address that problem. And what it did is it said that if the government is trying to uh, uh, surveil somebody who's overseas and they have a reasonable basis to believe that that person's overseas and not in the United States, they don't have to go to the court and get special permission for that particular surveillance. That's, that was what was radically different about uh, the 2008 statute, because it allowed the government then to go forward with communication surveillance for a, a number of people without having to go to get special permission for each and every communication. The problem, of course, is that for people like the plaintiffs in this case, that meant that their communications might get swept up as well, even though they were in the United States, because but by the of communicating with somebody who's outside the United States, they're going to get picked up in those, those surveillances. Um, the merits uh, will be fought out maybe someday, but there are a couple questions here as to whether or not uh, there's a foreign intelligence exception to the warrant requirement, uh, and the FISA Court of Review has found that there is. Uh, that's still an issue. The Supreme Court hasn't ruled on that. And then whether or not um, this communication, even if there is a warrant requirement, whether it's reasonable, or re even if it doesn't satisfy the warrant requirement, whether it's reasonable in the way it's conducted. So those are the merits. As I said, the issue here is one of standing. The, the, the plaintiffs say that they have standing because they are being incidentally uh, wiretapped because they're communicating with people overseas. Out of, out of concern for that, they are having to travel to meet these people in person, like their clients who are overseas, meet them in person so as to avoid being intercepted. They're therefore expending money having to go uh, to travel, and it's chilling their communication because, they're, because of the concern that what they say to their clients or others overseas might get picked up. This is the, that's the injury that they claim that they have. Um, the government says, no, that injury is really uh, illusory. Um, it's no different than maybe an attorney for a mafia crime family who will say, uh, who will challenge the criminal wiretap statute because of the concern that uh, their mafia clients might be wiretapped and they might get picked up in those, those wiretaps. Same thing. You, you don't have no right to challenge an otherwise valid communication uh, or electronic surveillance because you might get incidentally collected. That is the, that, that's the standing issue. The government says, uh, as I said, that there's, there's no standing, that there's, there's no injury, in fact, by, uh, that they can cite that would allow them to go into court. The stakes that are at play here are the following. One, uh, obviously, if standing is found and the plaintiffs go forward and prevail in this litigation to find that the FISA Amendments Act is unconstitutional, that would um, undermine a very valuable collection effort. In fact, the FISA Amendments Act is up for reauthorization, reauthorization this year, and the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence have filed letters saying that it's an enormously important uh, tool in the effort against terrorists and other foreign uh, threats. A second concern is that uh, if they find standing in this case, um, that would probably lead to other challenges by people who have lesser injuries to be able to cite that would uh, mean that more cases would come into court where uh, intelligence programs are being challenged. There would be disclosure of secrets about those intelligence uh, programs, and that would undermine national security. And I guess the last issue that, um, and the most probably sort of globally important, is that if standing is found in this case, then it's um, more likely that similar cases would, ha would, would be brought to the courts and more likely that judges, as opposed to the legislature and the executive branch, would be resolving some of these policy issues um, about the, uh, the lines that should be drawn around our intelligence programs. And that would be a dramatic shift in separation of powers and is probably the thing that would be on the front, uh, forefront of the minds of the justices when they decide this. So that's the national security uh, case. So I've got two criminal cases that they wanted me to to briefly mention, just to sort of round out the criminal docket for this year. One is called Bailey versus United States, and this is a Fourth Amendment case. It's fairly straightforward. It um, 
it, the question here is the extent of the ruling in a 1981 Supreme Court case called Michigan versus Summers. And that case basically said that when law enforcement agents go to execute a search warrant at a premises and there's an occupant in the premises, they can detain that occupant during the time that they're executing the search warrant. Uh, and the issue here is whether that rule extends to somebody who walks out of that residence right before the search warrant is executed and the police then follow that person some distance and stop that person away from the, the premises. In this case, what happened is you had a defendant, uh, I'm sorry, you had an informant come forward to the police, say that there was drug dealing at a certain location. The police got a search warrant. They went and surveilled the house right before executing the search warrant, saw a man fitting the description of the person that the defendant, uh, that the informant had said was a drug dealer operating out of that location. That, that man left, that's the defendant, that man left with another man, got in a car and drove away. The police followed him about a mile and then stopped him. He made statements connecting himself to the, the premises, had a key to the premises on him. The police brought him back to the premises in the intervening 10 minutes. The search had been conducted uh, and fellow officers had found guns and drugs in the location and they placed him under arrest. He moved to, to suppress the, uh, the evidence that was seized in the house, claiming that he had been stopped illegally uh, and the court found that Summers actually applied, and the rule that applied to people who were found on the premises similarly applied to people who were a mile away, who'd driven away. Um, the arguments, in short, are the following. They just look at the <coughs> rationale for the Summers opinion and uh, the justifications that were cited there for the police having the authority to, to <coughs> detain people who were on the, on the location of the search warrant. And those are danger to the police, um, keeping people who are on premises from uh, distracting the police while they're doing the search, <coughs> and also keeping people from fleeing. The defense here says, or the, the, the um, petitioner here says, wait a minute, those don't apply here. We were, there's no danger to the police. We'd driven away. Uh, we couldn't distract the police while they were conducting the search warrant because we had driven away. And um, you didn't have to worry about flight because we didn't even know the search warrant was happening. How would, why would we have any reason to, fly, to flee? The government's response is, no, you know, in this day and age, everybody has a cell phone, could have gotten a text, could have gotten a call, they could have turned back around, gotten a gun out, and taken on the police officers who were conducting the search. There is an officer safety concern. Uh, <coughs> same concern about uh, disrupting the, the search because they could have come back and gotten in the way of the search. And, um, and so the government is advocating a rule that so long as they stop the person as soon as reasonably practicable after that person <laughs> leaves the residence, the rule of Summers still applies and they can stop them. Uh, the significance of this, of course, is that it's uh, what the government is uh, proposing here is a further extension of the uh, ability to detain someone per, um, uh, incident to a search a, a search warrant. Just as we've seen in sort of the reverse, over the years there's been an expansion of the, uh, the right to search incident to arrest. We're seeing the same thing in this area. Uh, final sort of footnote, though, is that this might be a period victory for the defense if they win, because even if they win on the Summers issue, the government can still argue that it, the stop of the defendant was a legitimate Terry stop. They had a reasonable <coughs> suspicion to stop him, and that, that was, it's therefore valid. The stop is therefore valid, and the evidence obtained pursuant to the stop could still be admissible. Now, I was asked to, to talk about Maryland versus King, which is a case that <coughs> where cert has not been granted. I could speak about that now or wait. Please do. Questions. Why don't you take about uh, a minute and a half on it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Tick, tick, tick. Uh, Maryland versus King is a case uh, that cert petition is pending. And this is um, another Fourth Amendment case, but the question here <coughs> is the validity of the state and federal laws that allow for the collection of swabs of cells from the inside of the mouths of people who've been arrested. Um, the, there are 27 states, I believe, in the federal government that have laws allowing officers to swab the inside of a mouth of anybody who gets arrested, and that swab then gets DNA profiled and gets put in the system where it can help to identify the person who's there for that charge, but also can possibly connect them to other crimes. In this case in Maryland, the defendant here, uh, King, was arrested for burglary swab, that swab was checked, it came back as a hit to an old rape case that had been unsolved. He then gets charged with the rape, gets convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment for the rape. He then, uh, he challenged uh, the trial level, he challenged, um, he moved to suppress uh, the swab and the results of the, the swab and any connection to the rape. And the Court of Appeals ultimately uh, found that it should, be, should have been suppressed. And thereby invalidating 
the law in Maryland, which is the law in 26 other states in the federal government, allowing uh, the swabbing of um, people who are arrested. Not people convicted, but people who are just arrested. Uh, and they, they did it in a balancing of the defendant's privacy versus the government's interest in getting this information. And you could all think of what the, the factors are here. In terms of the defendant's privacy, you know, is it how intrusive is it to stick a swab in the mouth versus fingerprinting, which is, is well accepted. Um, and they also focused on, this is the Maryland Court of Appeals, on the concern that, the, that this process subjected the defendant to having his whole sort of DNA profile and genetic traits be exposed to the government. And that, that was a particularly intrusive kind of search um, that shouldn't be allowed. The state responded that, no, we have a, uh, the, the defendant's interest is, is, privacy interest is not that, uh, that strong. And in fact, they don't even, when, when you do a DNA profile, you don't even determine anything about the person's genetic characteristics. You just get a profile, which you can then match against other samples. Uh, the, um, the government also <coughs> is arguing that, um, that um, besides the fact that the, gov the defendant's in interest is not that strong, the government's interest is very strong because they need the ability to identify the person who's <coughs> arrested on the case that he's charged with, but also the ability to get those swabs to bounce that off of CODIS, which is the big DNA pro um, database throughout the country that has all the other uh, DNA samples to see whether other crimes, uh, this person committed other crimes. That's essentially, um, the, the, that's the argument. It looks like cert will probably be granted, at least that's the prediction. And the stakes are high here too, because that process has been tremendously important, both at finding people and incriminating them for crimes, but also exonerating people for crimes that they didn't commit. All right, Ken, thank you very much. You. Uh, if you have not run into legal commentary by our next panelist, then you don't get out much. Uh, after covering the Supreme Court for the New York Times, Stuart Taylor has written about legal affairs for virtually every big name publication that's printed on glossy paper and held together by staples. <coughs> he is a Princeton grad, has a law degree from Harvard, and he sometimes practices what he preaches as a lawyer. He was one of the first to warn against the rush to judgment in the Duke lacrosse case and then wrote a book about it. And now he has a new book about affirmative action, which is an issue the Supreme Court will be taking up this term. It's called Mismatch, How Affirmative Action Hurts Students It's Intended to Help and Why Universities Won't Admit It. It's very kind of you to summarize the entire book in the title. Um, he and his uh, co-author have also... Don't need to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> he and his co-author have also filed a friend of court brief in that affirmative action case. So, Stuart, why don't you start with that one? Good. Uh, fortunately, my assignment includes the same case I've already written a brief in, which requires a confession of bias, but also helped me with the homework. Uh, the case is Fisher versus University of Texas, the first affirmative action case the court has heard since uh, 2003, which will be argued on October 10th. Uh, I'll also spend a minute on Vance versus Ball State University, which is a workplace harassment case. Um, uh, we argue in the amicus brief, I should probably briefly disclose, that uh, Rick Sander and I, that um, black students are often, and Hispanic students are often harmed by racial preferences, by being put in academic environments without warning, uh, where the, the, uh, they're ill-prepared to compete with some of the uh, most competitive students in the country. Uh, we also argue that under pre principles previously established by the Supreme Court, uh, the University of Texas racial preference system that's at issue uh, in this case is unconstitutional, although I think there are respectable arguments both ways on that. And I think uh, the reason that I think Fisher is a good bet to become the most important affirmative action case ever uh, is simply the change in composition of the court since its last affirmative action case uh, in 2003 in the two University of Michigan cases, notably uh, the one on M University of Michigan Law School's affirmative action preference plan. Uh, the court split 5-4, uh, opening the door fairly wide as long as uh, quotas are avoided, as long as things are holistic, fairly wide to large racial preferences and admissions and has served as a model uh, for uh, universities around the country at every level, uh, medical school, law school, undergraduate school, uh, to entrench and even expand, uh, our book shows, I think, uh, their use of racial preferences, even though Grutter purported to lay down principles that would restrain the use of racial preferences. The reason uh, we think that they won't just say Grutter so Texas wins 
uh, is mainly that uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who wrote the Grutter opinion, it was 5-4, retired in 2005, was replaced by uh, Justice uh, uh, Alito, uh, who clearly is a vote against uh, racial preferences in most, if not all, cases. Uh, so now we have four solid votes in favor of racial preferences, the more liberal justices. Four solid votes we think are probably against racial pre preferences, the more conservative justices. And Justice Kennedy, who sits, uh, as in so many cases, right in the middle. In the Grutter case, uh, Kennedy joined the majority on one in critical point. Uh, the point was that uh, racial diversity has educational benefits that are substantial enough to make it uh, a compelling interest, that there's a compelling interest justifying use of racial preferences, if necessary, to get this kind of racial diversity. But Kennedy uh, dissented forcefully on uh, the so-called narrow tailoring requirement. He said that the university had failed to show uh, that it had met a number of the uh, principles that the majority had laid down, and that the majority had given far too much deference to the university's uh, claims. Um, the principles are briefly that racial preferences should not be resorted to until race neutral alternatives have been exhausted uh, to serve uh, the interest of racial diversity. Uh, that racial balancing is absolutely barred, and I think context suggests by racial balancing the court means seeking to mirror the proportions of various racial groups in the population at large. We, either nationally or in the state, uh, and also that racial preferences should not be perpetual. In fact, the court in Grutter said that in 25 years, we should expect this won't be uh, necessary anymore. That's 2028, 20, nine of the years are gone. A logical implication of the court's uh, statement in Grutter uh, was that universities would not wait until the, 20, the last day of the 24th year and then just stop. Uh, but, uh, but there's been no sign that any university in the country uh, I know of uh, has been slowing down in its use of racial preferences, if anything, the contrary. Um, so there are some internal uh, tensions within the Grutter opinion uh, that, uh, that will be worked out to some extent in Fisher. Um, so large are the stakes in this case that hundreds of organizations and groups representing virtually every major establishment institution in America from the university's educational establishments to corporate America and a lot of retired military people have all weighed in on the side of the University of Texas. The American establishment is, is totally bought into racial preferences for better or for worse. By contrast, and that's hundreds of organizations in 73 amicus briefs pro-preference. By contrast, only 17 briefs have been filed on the other side, mostly by small conservative advocacy groups. This amicus array illustrates a stunning disconnect on the racial preference issue uh, between the establishment institutions, the people who run institutions who have various reasons perhaps uh, to want uh, a formula for racial peace, and the American public at large, which has always disapproved of racial preferences by wide margins in, a, in any poll that makes it clear how they operate. Um, just a moment. So five of the current justices would have struck down the University of Michigan uh, racial preference regime that Justice O'Connor upheld and Grutter, Justice Kennedy being the fifth. Uh, but he's never said that uh, racial preferences should be banned entirely. To the contrary, as I mentioned earlier, he says that, uh, that there may be a compelling interest in some case somewhere. He's never identified a case in which he thought the compelling interest uh, justified the preference plan in question. So the issue, in, in one sense, in this case, is whether Kennedy will think that this case meets either that this case has a greater justification for racial preferences than the University of Michigan Law School did, or that that established a precedent he's bound to follow. One interesting thing, because uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of talk that, well, the court wouldn't have granted this case. They certainly didn't have to. It had standing problems, mm -hmm. uh, I was assured by liberal and conservative Supreme Court experts that there wasn't a chance they would grant it. I'm a little <laughs> sore at them because when they granted it, it ruined my book publication schedule. But so there, when they did, uh, uh, some, some people said, well, obviously they're granting this in order to, uh, to take a whack at affirmative action. Why else would they do it? But, and I'm, I've said that, but then I remind myself, 
it only takes four votes to grant a case. Did Kennedy vote to grant this case? Is he eager to whack affirmative action? Well, we don't really, we won't really know that for a while. Maybe we'll find out on October 10th during the oral argument. Uh, but maybe four justices uh, who want to take a whack at affirmative action at racial preferences and admissions decided that this was uh, the only train that was gonna be going by for a while. And that Justice Kennedy, in the end, if forced to say yes or no to this plan, would say no. Um, the, uh, the argument uh, that these preferences pass muster under Grutter was upheld by a unanimous uh, panel of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, including a very reluctant Judge Emilio Garza, whose opinion basically says, I hate racial preferences, but the Supreme Court has tied my hands and left me no choice, so I have to uphold them. Uh, on the other hand, seven of the 16, I think it is, judges of the Fifth Circuit voted to grant rehearing on bank and reverse. So they didn't think that Grutter tied their hands. And I think there's some speculation that maybe Judge Garza's uh, uh, concurrence in the result rather than, you know, was strategic, uh, that he was sending a message to the Supreme Court, you know, you guys have really wrecked everything. I, even I can't whack these racial preferences, so you're going to have to give me some more ammunition if I want to. Whatever his motivations, I think there are strong arguments on both sides. The best argument for the University of Texas is, you know, look, the court said you can't have numbers, you can't have quotas, you can't have targets. We don't have any of those things. And look, not that many people are involved here. The, the number of kids who are admitted to the, based on individual racial preferences to the University of Texas, on top of the so-called Texas 10% plan, which is not at issue in this case, there's no challenge in this case to the requirement that the top 10% of every high school uh, be admitted to the University of uh, <coughs> Texas, uh, that the number who are admitted on top of that, uh, of blacks and Hispanics basically, based on racial preferences, is, isn't very large. Uh, that's true. Um, the arguments coming back the other side, the ones that are most specific to, uh, to Grutter, are uh, the University of Texas, whatever the numbers are now, has set an explicit target of approaching representation of the population, proportional representation of each racial group in the population. We need more Hispanics because there are more Hispanics in the population. We need fewer Asians uh, by implication because we're already over, they're already represented at the university. And uh, that sounds a lot like racial balancing. The court said in Grutter, I'm not sure Justice O'Connor meant it, but she said, uh, echoing Justice Powell and Bakke, she said no racial balancing. Um, this, uh, I, I guess you could say they haven't engaged in racial balancing yet at the University of Texas, but that's certainly one of the objectives they cite. They also say that they want um, critical mass, enough you know, substantial representation of minority students, not just at the university, but in every class. Now, to get from here to critical mass in every class would take, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. Uh, I don't think it's going to get done within the remaining 16 years of the 25 that Justice O'Connor in Grutter said was supposed to be the limit. And so Justice Kennedy could go either way, uh, depending on which of those threads of analysis he wants to take on. Um, the, um, and then I have one other case. I'll, I'll leave that case now. Oh, well, one other point I might make on that case, uh, on the arguments that Fisher makes. Uh, they're adding individual preferences to a state law that had already achieved a 10% plan, substantial racial diversity by admitting the top 10%. Uh, and also they use extremely large double standards in admissions. And I think the public may not realize how large the standards are. In fact, quadruple standards with blacks being preferred over Hispanics, with both groups being preferred over whites, with all three groups being preferred, the evidence suggests, over Asians. For example, among freshen, freshmen entering UT in 2009 who were admitted outside the top 10% system, a staggering 467 points out of a possible 2,400 separated the mean SAT scores of, I'm sorry, of Asians and of blacks admitted with explicit, with explicit preferences. And the racial gaps in high school GPAs and, uh, of these freshmen largely mirrored the SAT gaps. Uh, which is part of the reason why our brief says 
these gaps are so large that the kids who are on the low end of them are going to have trouble competing. Um, let me turn to the other case. I'm going to summarize Very briefly. Very I'm briefly, sorry. if you would. Vance versus Fall State University to be argued uh, November 26th. Um, Supreme Court precedents render an employer vicariously liable under Title VII for pervasive or severe workplace harassment by a supervisor based on race, gender, or other protected characteristics. There's a conflict among federal courts of appeals among about who is a supervisor, so the justices have agreed to review the Seventh Circuit's 2011 decision in Vance, which went for the employer to clarify the scope of employer liability, full stop. Okay. Uh, briefly, Stuart, uh, is Justice Kagan taking part in the Fisher case, and if not, does it matter? She's not. I think it matters cosmetically. I mean, if there are five votes to reverse, there are five votes to reverse, and having uh, four dissenters wouldn't make much difference as opposed to three dissenters. I could imagine that that if you're Justice Kennedy, you might think, well, is it is it a little unseemly to be doing something this big uh, without uh, a full court? And just to state the obvious, if there's a 4-4 tie, then the university wins? Uh, yes, university wins a 4-4 tie. And, and the reason Justice Kagan is recused, by the way, is that she presided over an amicus brief that the Justice Department, when she was Solicitor General, filed in the lower courts supporting the University of Texas. Okay, thank you. Our next panelist uh, knows the Supreme Court from the inside, having been a law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas. Carrie Severino also went to Harvard Law and is the only member of our panel to have seriously overprepared for life by getting a master's degree in linguistics. Uh, that may help her as she speaks and writes on legal issues as the chief counsel and policy director of the Judicial Crisis Network, an organization that advocates in favor of the confirmation of judicial nominees with conservative values. Carrie. Thanks so much. Well, I'm going to have to have my degree in linguistics to speak fast here because I've been tasked with talking about two categories of cases, none of which have an actual grant. So I feel in both these categories I have to talk about quite a collection of cases to give you a sense of the field. One is in the same-sex marriage cases, the Defense of Marriage Act cases, and the Proposition 8 cases, and then the other one is in the Voting Rights Act cases. Both of these are issues that the court is likely to take on, um, but we don't yet know exactly how that's going to, going to play out because they haven't granted cert in any of these cases yet. And I think they also um, all share some interesting aspects of angles on the, the, the relationship between the state and the federal government. So first, to, to turn to the uh, Defense of Marriage Act and Proposition 8 cases, I'll talk about the, the DOMA cases first and then, then the Prop 8 case, which is a little less likely to be taken, but it provides a different angle. First, um, for some history on, on DOMA, it was passed in 1996 and has two main sections, only one of which is really at issue here. With the Section 2 it has to do with the, trying to protect states from being forced to recognize marriages of other states uh, that they would not recognize in their own. And then the Section 3 is the one that's being challenged in these cases here, and that is the section that deals with the defense of marriage for federal uh, purposes, purposes of federal law, federal taxes, a, you know, a whole host of federal laws. It says that for the purpose of federal law, that the word marriage means only a legal union between one man and one woman, a husband and wife, and spouse refers only to a person of the opposite sex. So that's the section of the law that President Obama famously has recently declined to defend, although the administration is still te technically enforcing it, they're not defending in court. And of course, that the House has now created the Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, um, which has been doing the defense, engaged in the defense of these uh, laws since the administration has, has uh, sort of abdicated its, its role in defending them, and uh, they have the able assistance <coughs> of Paul Clement in that task. So there, there are several cases that may be, that all of which have, have petitions for cert and the court's going to have to decide amongst. The first one, and probably the front runner, is uh, a combination a, a case of Gill versus Office of Personnel Management and then Massachusetts versus Department of Health and Human Services. This is a case that came out of Massachusetts, originally two different cases that have been combined. Um, and uh, they, they argue that the Equal Protection Clause violates Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act because, or the Defense of Marriage Act violates the Equal Protection Clause because there is no, uh, e either there is no rational basis for this or there doesn't, it, doesn't pass, it, it doesn't pass strict scrutiny. So there are various, the, the, the idea of which level of scrutiny it must pass uh, is, has been a question, but uh, they are, are happy to argue both. 
Um, this case is interesting because Justice Kagan actually was involved in as Solicitor General at the district court level even uh, during her confirmation hearings that it came out as part of the questions that she had, her office had been involved in, in doing some of the internal discussion of, how, of the strategy in the case, and so she would be recused from that case, and that provides a, a real wrinkle in the case. Other than that, we, we had <coughs> basically DOMA losing at both levels in the case. The district court found against it that the First Circuit also um, uh, found that the Defensive Marriage Act was unconstitutional. They uh, ruled on the Equal Protection Clause, and they ended up creating sort of a, a, a new level of scrutiny. Scrutiny is kind of a heightened but not officially heightened scrutiny, uh, which I think will, would be the the source of some concern from the Supreme Court of trying to figure out what level of scrutiny is, is really appropriate to be use, used here. This is the only case that actually has an appellate decision that is being appealed to the Supreme Court. So this is it, the, the bipartisan legal advisor group lost the case, has appealed for, for a, a petition for review to the Supreme Court, and that petition uh, was, was ready for consideration at the first conference that they, they had, the court had last week, but they didn't end up taking any action on us. They seem to be holding on to it. Another case which is, ha, has not had an appellate decision yet, but what the government has been, uh, has recommended that they grant cert on is called Galinsky versus Office of Personnel Management. This is a case out of California, and um, in this case, we have a district court uh, finding DOMA unconstitutional, but we, they have not actually had a Ninth Circuit argument yet. The same day that the, that the Department of Justice filed for cert, on the, in the Gill and Massachusetts case, they also filed a petition for cert before review. This is called, called rule, Supreme Court Rule 11. It's very rarely granted, but in, in certain extraordinary cases where there's an issue of overriding national importance, uh, the court does grant these things. They say, you may want to consider this case. Um, and it's interesting, the language they use, they say, a grant of certiorari before judgment is warranted to ensure that the court will have an appropriate vehicle in which to resolve the issues presented in a timely and definitive fashion. Now, I read that as shorthand for, please take this case because Justice Kagan's recused from the other case. So we have another case that's totally set up. It's already been appealed. But uh, actually, we'd rather have Kagan voting on this case. So, um, and, and of course, they filed a petition the same day. So it suggests that they, they, they were thinking of this. Um, it's actually not clear that the Department of Justice even has standing to appeal in that case. Uh, because they, they really won below. I mean, they're not there. They are arguing that the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. The court found the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. So I think that's one reason that the court would be hesitant to take this case, and actually this applies to several other cases. There are then two others. One is called <laughs> Peterson versus Office of Personnel Management. That's a Connecticut <coughs> case. There's Windsor versus U.S. Um, that was a New York case. All of these um, have, have been petitioned for uh, review by the Supreme Court. In all of those other cases, uh, the, re the petitioner was the person who won below. So this is, a, this is a, a serious standing problem of whether you have standing to appeal a case if you actually got everything you wanted in the case below. Some of them also have additional um, vehicle issues, we call them, that, that, would, that would make it unlikely the Supreme Court would want to take them. Windsor case, for example, the marriage was conducted in Canada, um, so the court would have to answer a question which I think ultimately turns on New York state law as to whether the Canadian marriage is valid in New York. So. There, there are reasons that a lot of them might not be great vehicles. So it really boils down to um, the Massachusetts case, the First Circuit, and then the, the California case that hasn't gone to the Ninth Circuit yet. The Department of Justice, I think, probably would want them to take the Galinsky case because they want to have uh, Justice Kagan sitting on the case. I think everyone views her as a, cl as a clear vote uh, against, against DOMA. Uh, but I think there are also some very strong reasons the court normally would take a case that has, that has heard the full appeal and the urgency concerns aren't really there when you have another case that's a perfectly good vehicle. I think the question is going to be whether the court views the risk of running into a 4-4 decision, which is a serious risk, uh, as being enough to then push them into the, the maybe equally un unpleasant situation of having a, a case that hasn't really been fully uh, dealt with ahead of time. Nonetheless, it seems like the court is at least holding them all to decide that altogether because they haven't made that call yet. Um, the Windsor and the Peterson cases, those are, those are the Connecticut, New York ones, will be finished briefing uh, at the end of October. That means that the earliest conference they could be considered at would be November 20th. Um, that actually, that keeps the, push the issue off until after the election. That probably suits the justices just fine. I think they'd rather not have the court uh, be part of the election 
uh, run up, and I'm sure if the court had granted on a, a same-sex marriage case of any of these, it, that would be pl factoring more into the, the campaigns that it already has. I think the Chief Justice in particular would really rather just have the court lie low in terms of the, the political things. Quickly, the Proposition 8 case, you probably all are familiar more or less with the, with the history of Proposition 8. California had several, several iterations on, of, uh, they had a, a Proposition 22, which said this, there's going to be no uh, same-sex marriage in the state. And then, then that was found uh, unconstitutional under the California Constitution. Then, they, then the court found that the California Constitution actually already provides for uh, same-sex marriage under its Equal Protection Clause, requires that. And there was a brief period during which same-sex marriages were performed in California. Simultaneously with that, there was Proposition 8 being prepared, and then, and then the election that passed it with a 52% majority as a referendum to say that it actually the, amending the California Constitution to say no, that marriage is between a man and a woman. So uh, that presents an interesting history which plays into the, the way that the court has decided it. Uh, this case had it w was sort of a sensational trial. There was a lot of uh, allegations about Judge uh, John uh, Vaughn Walker, who was the uh, district court judge, trying to publicize it, getting it kind of <laughs> shot down by the Supreme Court after trying to do that, and a lot of questions as to, as to the propriety of his sitting on the case or how, how, he, how he managed the case. He ultimately ended up coming down, um, to no one's great surprise, with a very broad ruling finding uh, that, that basically same-sex marriage was mandated by the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. So not merely that this one is, is, uh, is well, fine. Same-sex marriage isn't mandated, but oh, the, right okay. the, right, the right to same-sex marriage is fine. <laughs> you need not marry a member of the, of the same sex. But um, that, that states must, as a man, under the Equal Protection Clause, allow for same-sex marriage. So his ruling would be very broad. It wouldn't just deal with California. If, he, if, he was, if he's right, every state now had, cannot define their ma marriage as, as only between a man and a woman. Um, the Ninth Circuit took that case and came up with a much more narrow grounds, uh, which it looks to me is, is also a grounds uniquely tailored to try to appeal to Justice Kennedy. Uh, Judge Reinhardt uh, wrote the, the two to one decision uh, upholding it, and he basically said, look, it's, it's, we're not even going to address whether this passes rational basis, strict scrutiny, what, uh, scrutiny as, a, as a matter of itself, but, but once you have a state where there's a law that already says it's on the books. It says you may marry, and you eliminate that right for a specific class of people here, for people who want to want to engage in same-sex marriage. Then it it gets a sort of this heightened rational basis scrutiny that we saw in Romer versus Evans, and it, there seems to be no no reason for that except for an, just wrote am, animus against the uh, the the class of people that you're that you are removing from this marriage thing. So it makes a difference in their mind that, it's be, that it is removing it from um, a, a right that was already there. Now, set aside the fact that the right was there after um, the California court uh, found it, you know, having a, after this whole history of, of the citizens having, having passed referenda trying to block it and the, and the court continually finding the right again. Um, he said that's, that doesn't matter if, the, if it was there for a year, a week, or a day. If you've had the right and you take it away, that's um, now an equal protection violation. So this is criticized as a one-way ratchet. Anything you, you, you know, once you give a right, even if it's not required by the Constitution, you can never take it away now. Um, and he says, no, it's not, it's not a one-way ratchet. It just means that once you give rights, you can't take them away. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how that's not a, a one-way ratchet. But um, that, that is the much more narrow ground, so at least the gr that case really only applies to the situation in California um, in the way it's decided now. The Supreme Court hasn't made its call on the, on the cert petition for this case. It's possible um, that they would take it. I think if they take it, it probably is mostly, will mostly be to, to sh shoot them down. Uh, it's unlike, I think if they, if they approve of what they've done, they probably just let it stand. It's kind of such a quirky uh, opinion that it, it's not going to have that broad of an effect, except for in potentially expanding the way that Romer versus Evans is being interpreted. Frankly, you know, it, it, the Ninth Circuit isn't viewed by a lot of other circuits as a very controlling kind of precedent, a persuasive precedent, so I don't think they'd worry about leaving it if they, if they didn't want to do anything. If the court takes it, I think it's because they want to take issue with the way that Judge Reinhardt decided. There's also a, a arguably controlling case, Baker versus Nelson, that the Supreme Court decided. Uh, it was a, a summary dismissal of a, of a, a similar challenge uh, to a Minnesota uh, law defining marriages between a man and a woman, um, but the court really gave the back of the hand and didn't even consider that. So I think the court may, the Supreme Court may also be concerned that their precedent is not being taken seriously. 
So, uh, so those are, those are the main uh, cases that I think are, we're likely to see come up in the, in the same-sex marriage area. I'll quickly turn to the Voting Rights Act, um, which has another set of cases, but I think there's also a clear front runner in these. The Voting Rights Act it also has two main sections that are uh, that are of interest. The first is Section Two, which forbids voter discrimination. This was uh, trying to stop poll taxes and, and efforts to keep blacks from voting. Uh, then there's Section Five, which was designed to prevent states from basically inventing new workarounds of the, of the, from the discriminatory practices explicitly listed in Section 2. So what Section 5 says is if you are a, a state or a jurisdiction that requires preclearance from the Department of Justice, you can't change your voting rules until, unless we clear them ahead of time because you're basically, you know, a, it's a presumption of that you're probably going to do something wrong here. And these covered jurisdictions were those started in 1964 who had were using these, these improper tests and practices or had less than half of their eligible voting population registered to vote. So we assume that's because they, they had suppressed minority voter, voter registration. This has been, it originally was authorized for five years. This kind of suggests some of the analysis we saw in Grutter of this, these, these things to try to fix racial discrimination shouldn't be e perpetual, they should be time limited. Originally they were optimistic, they said five years ought to do it, we'll have this all fixed. In 1970 they realized they weren't quite there yet, they, they re-upped it for another five years. Now we're on to reauthorizing it at 25 years at a time, so I guess we've gotten less optimistic about uh, race relations over time. But they've, they've, over the years, kept on reauthorizing this, while not, since 1972, appreciably changing which, which uh, jurisdictions are covered. So the, the test for whether a state or a municipality or whatever this covered jurisdiction is should be required to go through this preclearance of, in, in a very heavy um, regulatory burden to do anything with its voting laws has to do with whether you were discriminating as of 1972. So now, and that's the real um, problem with this argument now is that in the court has suggested in the last, this has been challenged several times at the constitutionality of this act, particularly because it affects states differently. You could have, uh, for example, we have this now, Indiana voter ID was upheld and then Texas voter ID, which is very similar, is being held up by this preclearance process. The court even, the, the decided, even said, doesn't matter if you're like the Indiana case, Indiana is not under this preclearance routine, and you are. You might be fine in terms of constitutionally, it's a totally reasonable system, but you have to be pre-cleared, and that's an actually a, a much higher standard. So you have certain states who are held to higher standards than others, um, and it's not based on what they're doing today. Uh, for example, in Texas, there is higher minority registration, higher numbers of minorities in, in government positions than in Indiana. It doesn't matter how you're doing today, it matters that in 1972 you were having problems. Uh, so there are several places that have challenged this. One is a town, a majority black town in Kinston, North Carolina. Um, they're part of a county that's been covered since 1965, and DOJ refused to allow them to change to nonpartisan elections, even though the majority of the, minor, the, of the voters in the area, which were mostly minority voters, uh, wanted that. A change, and they they uh, were in the process of challenging it, and finally the Department of Justice it, it appear, apparently purposely mooted the case. They they changed their mind and decided to allow this change just as they were getting up to the um, the proper level to appeal. Uh, that said, um, they they've nonetheless uh, petitioned for review. So that that case has its vehicle problem because of that. The, the main case I think will be taken is Sh the Shelby County, Alabama case. This is another jurisdiction. All of Alabama has been covered since 1965. And Shelby County just didn't even ask for preclearance of any changes. They just challenged it facially. facially. They said, you, you're, you're requiring us to do these things. You're not requiring other states to do. Um, it's is not fair. And um, full disclosure, we, we, we filed the amicus brief uh, on behalf of ourselves and a group of former DOJ uh, officials uh, criticizing the uh, the use of Section 5 in this case, but uh, I, I think this is nonetheless the best case, the most likely case to be taken, partly because it doesn't have the mootness issue. There's also a couple um, cases that are coming up. I mentioned the Texas voter ID case. Uh, they have both a, a preclearance issue with voter ID and a preclearance issue with redistricting that has been working on a year and, and more of things. That, that the voter ID law was passed May 2011, where they still haven't been able to enact it because of this preclearance. That's sort of a lesson in how challenging it is. South Carolina actually enacted a voter ID law at the same time. They also are still in the middle of litigation. So this is an incredibly costly and time-consuming uh, process to do this. The court has suggested in the past, um, and Ken Justice Kennedy in an earlier decision in the, in the Texas context, that there are some real concerns about the unequal way that the states are being treated. And uh, I think they also maybe tipped their hand a little bit in, in a unanimous per curiam decision that came out 
uh, just this week uh, called Tenet versus Jefferson County. That, that was a West Virginia House redistricting uh, question, and they were trying to keep the they, they were re reorganizing their counties based on the census or their their districts based on the census and uh, it got shot down as it, it because there were s slight variations in the number of people in each county and uh, the court basically just said no, we're going to we're going to give them some some deference in, in some of the, in the factors they're looking at they wanted to try to keep entire counties together for example they said look these are these are perfectly reasonable things to do the, the difference between the sizes and the districts isn't so huge and that just suggests that maybe they're they're leaning toward according some deference to the state legislatures instead of having this over involvement of judges in the process so look for those those mm -hmm. cases coming up but probably not early enough to affect the, the November elections Carrie thank you an obscure section of the U.S. Code specifies that whenever 15 people gather to talk about the Supreme Court, the next panelist must be present. Tom Goldstein created and directs SCOTUS blog, which he's made the indispensable one-stop website about the court. On June 28th, when the court handed down the health care ruling, more than a million people turned to the blog for word of the decision, which they got fast and accurately. Tom spends his free time as a lawyer specializing in the Supreme Court. He's argued 25 cases before the justices, which is a remarkable number for a lawyer who can still accurately be described as young. <laughs> Tom? Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, thank you so much to the Federal Society. Really, there is no organization in the United States that is better at serving as a forum for the principal legal issues of the day, and to Doug Cox, one of the nation's great lawyers, and Pete Williams, uh, an uh, unbelievable journalist. <laughs> I've been asked to comment as well on the voting rights and same-sex marriage cases. Carrie has done such an incredibly good job in objectively describing the cases that there's very little to add, and then I'm going to talk about the business cases. The two points that I would make about uh, the same-sex and vote, voting rights act cases are first to think about why it is the justices would get involved because this is predictive as you mentioned these cases aren't in the docket just a little illustration into how the court works it famously takes only one out of a hundred cases but DOMA has been invalidated by a federal court of appeals and the justices basically have a rule that says if we're going to strike down a federal statute in the federal judiciary that's our job the Supreme Court's job so they're very likely to step in the Voting Rights Act cases, several of them come on appeal. Generally, you have to ask the Supreme Court for permission to grant review in your case. But there are tiny, tiny little slivers of cases in the United States Code that there is a right to go to the Supreme Court in, and they have different ways of dodging them. But the Voting Rights Act cases, they almost have to take. And in a recent case, the Northwest Austin case, they've suggested very serious concerns about the constitutionality of Section 5. They have a lot of interest in this issue, so I agree that they'll take the cases. The second point I was going to make is what to expect from the, di the kind of pivotal justices. Obviously, Justice Kennedy on ideological questions sits at the center of the court. And one might wonder about the disconnect. On the one hand, Stewart's confidence, and I think rightly so, that he will have real suspicion about a race-based program like the Affirmative Action Program at the University of Texas. And the felt sense in the gay rights community that he may be an ally, particularly after the Romer case. And you think, well, gosh, the the concern about affirmative action is a very conservative worldview, and the possibility that you would endorse a constitutional right to same-sex marriage is a very liberal worldview. How is it that we have those in the head of one single person? Um, and the reason is that Justice Kennedy has a, a vision of the law and of the Constitution that is very much about individuals. He wants people to be thought of as people, not of, as groups. And so his concern, I think, at the root of affirmative action is that you are treating people as black. You're treating them as Hispanic and not as individuals. And on the other hand, in the same-sex marriage context, in the gay rights context, that you are treating people as a member of a group that you have hostility to, they're homosexual. You're not thinking about them as individuals. And you know, on the other hand, striking down the definition of marriage is a huge deal. And it is a puzzle that nobody knows the answer to uh, what he will do in these cases. Uh, the second justice to think about, I think, is John Roberts, the chief justice. I think he plays maybe not a pivotal role ideologically, but he has a very important role at the Supreme Court in terms of how fast the court does anything. Some of his still more conservative colleagues, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, when they have a solid majority, want to get to the end result. Justice Kennedy as well, something that he believes strongly in, he will provide a strong fifth vote in. The Chief Justice has been much more concerned of taking things incrementally, and that will play out in all the big cases of the term. Do you say that affirmative action is unconstitutional per se, or do you cut back on the Grutter decision? Do you say that there is a constitutional right to same-sex marriage always or never, or do you take a baby step in that area? Do you say that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional all across the board, or do you carve back 
on the, pre the number of jurisdictions that are subject to the preclearance regime, that sort of thing. So I think you'll play an incredibly important role. The other thing I will mention, just putting those two cases to the side, I'll just add a Fourth Amendment case. Ken very carefully covered the docket of all of the uh, search and seizure cases coming up. Be attentive to just the, uh, the new grant on when it is the police can take blood when they think that you are driving under the influence. And there is an important case about that where a state, sta a state practice of taking the blood even when there was no accident was struck down on the ground that the police had to have a warrant. I would be, surri I would be surprised if the states lost that because you know the, the alcohol in the blood dissipates and I think the justices will believe that there's a right to take it. But that's a case that affects a lot of people. Uh, the, uh, nobody here, uh, and nobody out there, but a lot of people. Uh, I've also been asked to touch on the business docket. Let me just mention in passing some of the business cases. None of them are very interesting. The, uh, there are two follow-on cases to a very significant decision from two terms ago, the Walmart case, which famously was an attempt to have a class action on behalf of hundreds of thousands of women who had worked for Walmart, and the justices said you can't put everybody into that case together. The justice has also signaled in that case concern about class action procedure. Class actions is when you try and have one law for people out there, not here, but, uh, when you try and have one lawsuit that aggregates a lot of people. The business community very concerned that these cases can be so big that they can be extortive. Civil rights attorneys very concerned about cutting back on class actions because it's too expensive to litigate each case one by one. The justices in the Amgen case and the Comcast case in which I'm involved will consider the question of how much judges should decide about the case before certifying the class and saying everybody can be in all the lawsuit together. So will they, do they have to figure out if all of these people can have one theory of damages? Do they have to have, uh, have to look into whether there was a fraud in a securities fraud case? So it will be more in line uh, of the Walmart decision about class action procedure. Two other tiny little cases. One is an interesting thing for people who are in college and trying to get textbooks that aren't incredibly expensive. The Supreme Court has an important copyright case about when it is that you, what happens with gray market goods. So you buy, for example, textbooks made overseas where they're sold at a lower price and imported into the United States. Does the producer of that book or of any other copyrighted material have a right to limit it coming into the United States? And then the, there are actually a body of cases on questions of when it is a lawsuit is moot. It's a very lawyer's issue. But for those who are interested in that and are practicing lawyers, the Supreme Court has five cases on its docket this term on the question of when it is someone has standing or the case is moot. And that is, oddly, I think, the principal theme that we'll run through all the cases that nobody will pay attention to. Uh, you've gone seriously under your time. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me ask you a question again about Justice Kagan. Um, Kerry mentioned the fact that in the Gill case, this is the case of the folks in Massachusetts who were cha the challenging DOMA that she would be recused in that case. The, the state of Massachusetts also filed its own claim against DOMA. And those two cases were decided the same day by the same district judge, but separately. Uh, and then the district, or the, the Court of Appeals uh, combined them. Does that mean she would have to recuse from both those Massachusetts cases or just Gill? It would depend on the details. So this is a, we're gonna do an inside baseball analysis of something that's very inside baseball like layers upon it. But this is the important question that Kerry flagged of whether we'll have nine justices in the case. And I think it's most likely that because those were, there were two different lawsuits, but they were going on at the same time, it will depend a lot on the highly technical question of whether she did anything in the Massachusetts state case while she was the Solicitor General. Well, she talked about it, participated. Her rule and the rule of all the justices has been like, if I touched it, I'm out. And I would just guess it's very likely that at the time, since she was in the government at the time that lawsuit was going on, that she would have enough involvement. And I think that Kerry has it exactly right that the government, I don't know that it's that they want her vote, but I think that they want, I mean, they obviously want her vote, but if they expect her to vote for, the, for their position or not, but that they are trying to make sure that the court has available to it cases where all nine could participate. And my bet is, uh, in fact, I'm pretty confident that they are convinced that she wouldn't participate in either of the Massachusetts cases. And then just let me ask you another question about class actions. Why is this question of whether you can certify a class so important to the business community? Is it because the ball game is basically certifying the class and then it's the whole thing is over from then on? Yeah, I passed through that too quickly. That was the notion of extortion, and that is the business community's view of this is that once the judge says, okay, 
all of these people are in this lawsuit together. So you're now not litigating the damage claim of a person. You're now litigating the damage claim of 1,000 people or 10,000 people or 100,000 people. The, the pressure on the defendant in that case is so great to settle because if you lose, if you don't settle, it could be bankrupting. And the court has been sympathetic to that concern and has been willing to say, well, before we kind of let loose the dogs of war so significantly, we better make sure this is a really legitimate class action and allow the judges to consider various things up front. But these are two things they have not said before that have to be decided up front. Whether it is the allegedly fraudulent statement in a, a securities fraud case has to have been a material one. And do all of the plaintiffs have a similar theory of, dam of damages for their case? Okay, thank you. Our final panelist, Professor Nick Rosencrantz, teaches constitutional law here in Washington at Georgetown Law Center and spans the nation with legal commentary, writing for both the Harvard and Stanford Law Reviews. He, too, is a former Supreme Court law clerk, in his case, for the much-discussed today, Anthony Kennedy. And he served in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel as an attorney advisor. And perhaps somewhat atypically for a member of the Federalist Society's Board of Visitors, he has a sideline as a Broadway producer. Honest. Professor. Great. I'm delighted to be here. I used to be a bit nervous about doing Supreme Court preview panels, but I now find that by the time the cases come down, nobody remembers what it is that I <laughs> said about them. So you'll actually find me making reckless predictions. <laughs> and I think uh, you probably will not remember those once the cases come down. I've been asked to talk about three cases uh, and then one uh, cert petition that's pending. So the first two are called the dog sniffing cases. They're a pair. And I think people are interested in these primarily because they have dogs in them. Uh, the, the two dogs here are named, in one of the cases, Aldo, and the other one, Frankie. And I think people, people seem to, um, to respond to that. Jardines, in this case, the question is, uh, so a dog, these are Fourth Amendment cases. So a dog is brought to the front door of a house and put by a police uh, handler and the police knock on the door and then the dog, um, uh, the dog sni can sniff inside the house when the door is open, or maybe I guess before the door opens, and alerts, signals that the dog is smelling whatever it was that he was trained to smell, in this case, uh, narcotics. And the question at issue in this case is, is that a search? Is the, is the dog sniff itself and the alert, is that a search of the house which triggers Fourth Amendment scrutiny, right? So the Fourth Amendment says no unreasonable searches and seizures. Is that a search that triggers our Fourth Amendment inquiry? Um, you know, I actually think it's a pretty, well, uh, on the one hand, the court has many times said, no, dog sniffs are not searches. The only way in which this case is different is it's a house, and the court has expressed a lot of um, a, a lot of concern about privacy within the home. Uh, so on the one hand, you have these uh, these prior dog sniffing cases saying not a search. On the other hand, though, there's this case called Kilo, which is about uh, thermal imaging of a house, and the court says so. So peering into the house, as it were, by uh, reading the heat signature that's coming out from the roof and the walls. And the court said that was a search. So that was a search in Kilo. And so you could say, well, is this like Kilo? Is it kind of the dog peering into the house, sort of like the thermal imager peering in? Or is it like all those other dog sniffing cases? And I think it's very likely the court is going to say this is like the other dog sniffing cases, not a search. You know, the key difference between Kilo and the dog sniff, if you think about it, you think about trying to balance the costs and benefits of the search, if you're trying to think, or the, the costs and benefits of the search or non-search. Um, and uh, one of the costs of police searches um, are costs to privacy, right? exposing information that you'd rather keep secret. And as to that, a dog sniff is actually the least intrusive imaginable thing because it's, the result is totally binary. Right? It's just either there is contraband or there is not contraband, but it tells you nothing else about what is in the house or what you're up to or whether you have pornography or whatever else you, you, know, you might find embarrassing in your home, it doesn't tell you that. It just tells you there's um, drugs or non-drugs. In Kilo, the court was careful to point out that the, um, or was concerned actually, that the, the heat signature could tell you other things. So it could tell you, the court said, um, 
when the lady of the house was taking her bath, that sort of thing, and that was a concern to the court. But the dog sniff doesn't tell you that. So I, I don't, um, I don't act. I think that's actually a pretty easy case, and I think that the court, you know, I wouldn't actually surprise me if that was unanimous. I think that's a pretty easy case to tell you the truth. Um, so the second case called Harris, this other dog sniffing case, this involves um, the police officer stopping a car. I think the tail light is out or something. And um, the dog, they take the dog around the car to sniff around the car, and the dog alerts on the, do on the door handle, sig signals that they smell something they were trained to smell. And this is, a, uh, this is just a different dimension of the Fourth Amendment question. So here we're not asking, is the dog sniff a search? Here we're asking, so the, the dog alerts on the, um, on the car, and then the police officer searches the car and finds all kinds of contraband. And so here we're asking a different question, not is the dog sniff a search, but does the dog sniff constitute probable cause for the policeman's search, right? Is that, is that enough information for the police officer to go on to now open up the car door and look inside? Now, in this case, there were a bunch of other facts. The guy was apparently nervous, and he had an open beer can and so forth. So there, there were some other reasons for the police officer to be suspicious. But the case, what, what the case is trying to get at is how, um, how uh, much information does the dog sniff give you? Is it enough to constitute uh, probable cause for this search? And you know, I actually think it's a kind of a tricky case. I, I, I started out thinking this also was an easy case, and the court was going to say this was fine. but. You know, the government's brief kind of overreaches in this case. So the government's brief really sounds a lot like, uh, trust us, we're the government. You know, really don't, um, you know, don't worry. These dogs are really well trained and the likelihood's really pretty good. That, and um, it's not that persuasive, actually. So the, you know, the Florida Supreme Court, which decided this was not okay, Florida Supreme Court just wanted some other facts. So the Florida Supreme Court said, well, wait a second. Can you just tell us how often there are false positives, you know, how often the dog alerts and there in fact are not drugs. And can you tell us a little bit about the training programs and, you know, what the statistics are? Because, you know, ultimately this is supposed to be a probabilistic inquiry, right? What are the odds? What are the odds that we've, we're going to find something in the car? You know, the, the government, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the petitioner says, well, um, sorry, not the petitioner, the respondent says, um, says, uh, the dog often alerts to residual smells, right? Things that were not in the car now, but were in the car at some prior point, or even, um, you know, smells that were on people's hands as they opened up the handle of the door. In this case, as it happens, the dog is trained to alert to methamphetamines, and what they find in the car is not actually methamphetamines, it's um, precursors to methamphetamines. The driver, apparently a methamphetamine addict, maybe had some on his hands. He um, transfers the smell to the door. The dog alerts to the door. So that's what happened. But um, you know, he wants to say, well, um, how often does that happen? How often is it really just residual smells? I mean, it could be the you know the the garage attendant or the gas station guy or whatever. And um, the government says, look, it's uh, we allow this for people. So if the police smell you know marijuana, they can then follow that up and see because they you know they're probably right about that. And the dog has even a better sense of smell than the human being. So surely if it's okay for um, humans, it's okay for the dog. But, um, uh, you know, it's actually, it's, would, you, you could argue it cuts the other way, right? The dog has the better sense of smell, and thus the dog is going to pick up the residual smell that the human being would not pick up, right? So, um, you know, are there, so quite what constitutes a false positive is one question. Is it, a, is it false if the dog is actually alerting on a residual smell? And then, um, you know, do we care? Do we need to know what the odds are? So that's what's at issue in this case. I really think the government brief overreaches a bit on this. So I think the court will say something about, you know, needing to know the statistics and needing to know the um, training and whatnot. The court's comfortable saying that stuff. And they say it about fingerprints and about DNA. They like to know the stats. You know, they like to know the odds. These are probabilistic inquiries. So I don't think that they're going to quite agree to the trust us, we're the government theory. I'll just say one other thing about this. Um, you know, what puts pressure on a lot of this doctrine is a couple missteps in Fourth Amendment doctrine, earlier missteps. So one of them is, um, as a general matter, uh, if you are conducting a search, you need a warrant. And uh, that's not obvious on the text of the Fourth Amendment, and in fact, it's probably wrong, but it pushes, uh, puts a lot of pressure on the definition of search, makes you want to say, 
this is not a search because if you say it is a search, you have to get a warrant and that seems maybe crazy in some circumstances. So you know, if we didn't have that, if we took the text of the Fourth Amendment seriously, it only requires that searches be, not be unreasonable. If we took that text seriously, we'd be comfortable saying, yes, the dog at the front door is a search of the house. It's just a reasonable search of the house. And I think that would probably be a cleaner, better way to talk about what's happening. You know, another doctrinal, kind of prior doctrinal error, I think, is um, if the search is bad, we exclude the evidence. And so we exclude the, exclude the evidence, and then the criminal potentially gets to go free. And the court doesn't like that. So the court does not like letting the bad guy go free. Um, you know, if you imagine in this, um, to change the facts a bit of this guy and his drugs in the car and make it a, the dead body, right? So if there's a dead body in the car and the dog alerts, but somehow the search is bad, the court really does not like saying, you know, oh, sorry, you know, we'll send you on your way now and here's your dead body back. They don't, you know, <laughs> they don't actually like to do that. And so, but because of the exclusionary rule puts pressure on these doctrines, so it makes them want to say it's not a search or it's per se reasonable or something. And so that, I think, is the big hope for the government is they're not. Isn't that what happy. habeas corpus means? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. 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 Thank you, Latin fans. Exactly. Uh, so those are the two dog sniffing cases, uh, I think, and those are maybe how those are going to come out. And then uh, the third case I'm supposed to talk about is Kiobel. I'm nervous talking about this one because uh, I think there's about 20 people in the room who know more about this than I at least. Um, and half of you looks like filed amicus briefs in this case. But um, so Kiobel's about a statute called the Alien Tort Statute. And so it uh, grants... Uh, district court's original jurisdiction over, quote, any civil action by an alien for a tort only committed in violation of the law of nations or a treaty of the United States. And this is a very old statute um, enacted by the first Congress, but it sat dormant for uh, 170 odd years. And then um, uh, some civil rights type folks picked it up and uh, human rights type folks and um, uh, um, decide and uh, started bringing cases in which the plaintiff is foreign, the defendant is foreign, and the tort took place in some foreign place, and started bringing these cases in U.S. courts. So the you know the Paraguayan plaintiff, the Paraguayan defendant, and the tort took place in Paraguay, and they come on into a New York state court, a New York federal court, and say, um, "We you have jurisdiction over this." See. Uh, the alien tort statute and uh, courts have been going for this so courts have been allowing some of these cases to go forward kind of odd as it sounds strange as it sounds um, and so this case raised the question of whether there was so so in this particular case um, uh, the Kiobel is uh, takes place in Nigeria and uh, the guy says uh, the Nigerian government committed these torts against me uh, uh, mistreated me torture and so forth and um, these oil companies, foreign oil companies, were complicit, helped the Nigerian government do this to me, were complicit, aided and abetted as they did this. And, uh, so, um, and, and so I'm wanting to sue the oil companies, right, in federal court. And the oil companies defend and say, um, this, doesn't, this doesn't apply to corporations. Can't actually sue a corporation under this statute. And that was their claim last year at the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court heard argument in the case and did something very unusual, which is actually, um, set, actually said to the parties, um, we want to consider a broader question. So go back and we'd like for you to brief not just this question of does it apply to corporations, but actually the much broader question of does it apply extraterritorially at all? Does it apply to acts that happen in, in the land of foreign sovereigns at all? Um, it's very unusual for the court to ask the parties to um, brief a bigger, a bigger issue than the issue that really is, um, uh, was originally briefed by the court. So, um, and so now the court is, now the parties are arguing about um, whether this applies extraterritorially at all. Uh, it's the, the sheer fact that the court did that strongly suggests that the court is nervous about this statute and is wanting to um, cut back on its scope. I think everybody thinks that. Uh, the big question is quite how far will they go? So the, um, the Solicitor General says um, you, you should be very cautious about extending it extraterritorially and it doesn't usually extend extraterritorially, but leave the door open 
leave the door open, it might sometimes apply extraterritorially. And in particular, in that Paraguay case from 1980, that one actually was a good use of the alien tort statute. Uh, the Phil Ortega case, they, they want to bracket this one little narrow set of facts, but they then, but the SG says mostly yes. It probably doesn't go, it probably doesn't apply extraterritorially generally. And um, some, uh, the former state legal advisors filed a brief saying, don't have that be the rule. Have the rule be a clean rule that we can know what to do with, and let's have the clean rule be it doesn't apply extraterritorially. Um, you know, I think the court might do that, but you know, I actually think as to this, the SG might, the SG position might prevail. It's, uh, I clerk for Justice Kennedy, he's not usually one to close the door to an entire category of litigation. So you know, I more, more tend to think that he would say, um, uh, not for this case and not for most cases, but maybe for some future case. So I think he'll take a, you know, a view that's kind of like the SG's view if I had to guess about this. I'll give you 30 seconds on a pending cert petition. This one's called USB Bond, and I'll um, confess that I filed a brief in this case. I'm trying to, I'm hoping the court will grant cert in this case. This case is, um, so uh, the wom uh, a woman um, uh, spreads chemicals on the doorknob of her neighbor. Uh, she's discovered that her husband is having an affair with a neighbor, she spreads chemicals on the doorknob of the neighbor, and this is many different kinds of state crime, as you can imagine. Um, but an ambitious, uh, ambitious assistant U.S. attorney goes ahead and charges her under the Chemical Weapons Convention <laughs> Implementation Act, which you know you could imagine was really not. It wasn't actually. It wasn't really, wasn't really targeting this kind of <laughs> fact story. But it's you know it seems to fit. It seems to fit. She's using chemicals to try to harm the neighbor or whatever. And she says, uh, where does Congress get power to enact this statute? Where does Congress get the power to pass this thing? And uh, in the Third Circuit last year, the, um, the court said, you don't have standing to make that argument. The US Supreme Court last year said, of course she has standing to make that argument, 9-0. No, now go back and consider the argument. It went back to the Third Circuit, and the Third Circuit said, OK, on the merits, yes, Congress has power to enact this. And the reason is because there's this treaty. So they say, they say um, uh, whether or not Congress generally has power to enact something, if we enter into a treaty promising a certain category of legislation, Congress automatically gets the power to enact the thing, even if they wouldn't have had the power otherwise. See a case called Missouri v. Holland from 1920, which seemed to say that. And so uh, you know, to put a kind of finer point on it, treaties can increase the power of Congress. The president can find a foreign country, find Zimbabwe, agree on, you know, agree that we should regulate guns near schools or regulate violence against women or, you know, regulate health care or whatever it is. And then suddenly Congress has new power on this theory from Missouri v. Holland. The Third Circuit says, yes, that's the rule, see Missouri v. Holland. But they also said, uh, Judge Ambrose in concurrence in particular said, this, um, uh, we urge the Supreme Court to have another look at this because this seems kind of crazy to us. So that's um, what has been teed up in the cert petition, uh, and I've filed an amicus on behalf of Cato in this. We're really hoping the court picks it up and um, overrules Missouri v. Holland, we hope. All right, thank you all. Let me uh, just ask you all a question, picking up on something that Tom Goldstein said about the court being reluctant to take big steps. So here we have potentially some big step cases. An invitation for the court to deal a serious blow, if not eliminate aff affirmative action in school admissions, to strike down or uphold a federal statute, DOMA, to uh, seriously change the workings of a landmark civil rights law, the Voting Rights Act. Is the court going to take those big steps, or is it going to do this incrementally? Thomas, why don't you answer your own question that you posed? Um, I think that in the same-sex marriage area, it's just very difficult to predict because uh, Justice Kennedy, I think, will have two things pointing in different directions for him, the notion that this is a form of animus, about groups and the other that the definition of marriage is an absolutely traditional institution. I do think that the felt sense five years ago is that cases like this had no chance at all of prevailing in the Supreme Court. And it's just been, there's, there's just been a change in conventional wisdom that I don't know corresponds with picking up a vote in the Supreme Court. Uh, in terms of the Voting Rights Act and affirmative action, these are areas where I think Justice Kennedy does believe strongly. And when he believes strongly in something, that does tend to drive the court to move further faster. And so I would be surprised if 
uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act survives unscathed substantially, where the court a couple of years ago sent a warning shot to Congress that said, you better change this thing. Uh, and when it comes to affirmative action, I would be quite surprised. I don't know if they'll formally overrule Grutter, but I would be surprised if the, the rule looked anything like at the end of this term what it looks like now. Others of you on this same question about big steps? I, I, I agree with Tom, and I also think uh, Justice Roberts has taken a big step or two in his time. Chief Justice Roberts, Citizens United was a pretty big step. Uh, the, um, the school integration case, uh, Seattle, a couple of years ago was a pretty big step, and I think he feels pretty strongly uh, about racial preferences based on what he said before and, and based on his opinion in the Northwest Austin case, I think it was his opinion, uh, he pre feels pretty strongly that the Voting Rights Act Section 5 is deeply flawed. And, and this is the, that's the pre-clearance section. Yeah, and as, um, and as Tom said, I'm, I'm not sure where he goes next on voting rights, if not a big step. If uh, you, you say to Congress, this stinks, fix it, and Congress ignores you, what do you say next? Nick, Kerry? I, I think I generally agree. Voting Rights Act, they'll, they'll probably take a big step, partly because they've, they've tried the little step of signaling as many times as they, as they could. Um, DOMA, I think there, there was a lot of room for them to, have, to do bigger steps. I mean, they could do something like Judge Walker's uh, district court opinion in the Prop 8 case and just say there's this you know, equal protection right to, to uh, same-sex marriage. I don't think there's any chance they would do that. So th there's a lot of room for very small steps in various ways. I think if they, whatever they do, it'll probably be a smaller step in that case. And I suspect also in Fisher, whatever they do, I don't think they'll call it a big step. I don't know that they'll call it overruling Grutter, just because it's a recent enough case. I think they'll, they'll at least, w whether they're making a big step or not, they'll, they'll present it as a modification of existing uh, doctrine. Yeah, I guess I'll just say on the topic of big steps and small steps, that um, you know, big steps are often tarred with the brush of judicial activism. and. I don't think we should do that in a kind of a knee-jerk way. I think actually the big step is often the is often the logically necessary step, and the kind of the small step is it can be incoherent a bit or create kind of odd doctrinal anomalies. So you know, the big step is oftentimes the right answer, and you shouldn't kind of reject it just on the grounds that it's a big step. Federalist Society endorses judicial activism, noted scholar says. Um, possible headline from today, I'm just saying. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this question. Does it matter how the justices get along well with each other after what were apparently some somewhat surprised, if not hurt feelings at the end of last term? Does that matter at all in terms of what we'll see happen this term? Or is that all forgotten and everyone's happy now? Thomas? Well, I mean, the justices have a remarkable capacity to get along that in the wake of Bush versus Gore that that crew could come back and despite the depth of feeling uh, and intensity of that case that uh, it just shows an institution that unlike most others really does function. In terms of whether it really matters, I, you know, there's, there are folks here who clerked on the court and have a really good understanding of the internal dynamic. Um, I don't think it ultimately is essential that they get along, but it makes it certainly makes the day go by a lot easier. Uh, and it is, one thing I will say is sometimes, it, to get to a coherent rule of law, when you have nine very strong-willed people who have very diverse views sometimes, people have to give. They have to be willing to kind of say, okay, I don't agree with that exactly. If I'm gonna get to an opinion that has five people in it. And at that point, it is essential that they get along because one of the things that is you know, the Chief Justice has been very successful about is getting rid of these opinions that are, you know, four, three, two, with Justice A agreeing in part one B four two, except for footnote seven. Uh, and we've gotten, you know, we know what the rules are. And that that relationships I think could play a part a role there. What about you former clerks? Yeah, I'll just agree with Tom. I actually clerked the term after uh, Bush v. Gore, and I saw no evidence whatsoever of any kind of um, residual personal uh, antagonism or anything like that. I mean, I think they're really able to set the work and the, to set the work to one side. They uh, they always seem to get along well personally, as far as I could tell. And one other related question to this: uh, Can we conclude anything at all about? what Chief Justice Roberts is likely to do this term based on his vote in the health care case. Does that signal anything? Is, it, is he now armor-plated? Uh, what does it mean? 
I don't, I don't think it means very much. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those naive folks who thinks maybe he just wrote the opinion he wrote on health care because that's what he thought. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it seemed to me the opinion was, uh, and others will throw stuff at me, was plausible enough uh, on its own terms. Uh, there is speculation that, well, now that he's showed he's not a right-wing nut all the time, he can go back to being a right-wing nut most of the time. Uh, I, I doubt he thinks that way. <laughs> Any other thoughts on the question about Chief Justice Roberts? I agree. I don't think you can, I don't think you can deduce much from it. Okay. Uh, we invite questions now from those of you here. Uh, there's someone with a microphone who will make his way. There's a question from this exceedingly well-dressed uh, journalist in the back, which is very rare in our business. Hi, it's uh, Josh Gerstein with Politico. At the price of being a bit predictable, I'm wondering if anybody on the panel could comment on whether any of the cases you've discussed here would offer opportunities for either Governor Romney or President Obama to score political points, say, at the upcoming debates or in some other forum, and what those are, that argument might sound like on these issues, uh, and is there any earthly chance that either of them would try to do something like that? <laughs> I mean, the only case that has gotten onto the radar of the broader public would be health care, and I think it would be a reference back. The Supreme Court, because the economy takes all the oxygen out of the election with a little bit of foreign affairs, the Supreme Court just doesn't play among un independent, undecided voters. But it is a motivator for one's base to get out and get to the polls because you want this person to replace, you know, Justice Ginsburg when she retires, for example. And healthcare is the only thing that really resonates. If you want to know if there's any practical consequence to the election in the short term, it would be the point that Kerry made that the Obama administration has declined to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. And you, uh, President Romney might well decide that he would defend the constitutionality of that statute. But it doesn't seem that that kind of social conservative question has a lot of salience in something like a, a presidential debate. So I think that it will, other than healthcare, I can't see much happening. Stuart, do you want, can you answer that with respect to yeah. the issue um, of affirmative action? I, 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 think it's, uh, I think it will not happen. Uh, the person, and, and here's why. No major national political figure has attacked affirmative action publicly since 1996 or before. It's kind of remarkable. The Republicans who, during the 90s for a while, uh, were seeing some political profit in attacking affirmative action, given the polls, uh, don't do it anymore. And the Democrats, uh, John Kerry in the early 90s, uh, Joe Lieberman in the early 90s, and some others said maybe it's time to stop these racial preferences. Uh, the Democratic Leadership Council was inching down that road. Uh, but that's all gone. I think, the, and I've spoken to a Republican politician, you know, why, why is that? And the answer was we get so demonized if we ever raise our voices against affirmative action, it's just not worth the cost, not worth the hassle. Uh, I think part of it, ironically, was there was an incredibly bitter campaign in California over Proposition 209, which banned racial preferences in state programs in 1996. Uh, really bitter. And, um, and, and I think it's fair to say that there was an awful lot of demonizing and demagogy going on against the uh, supporters of Proposition 209 uh, against the people opposing affirmative action. Uh, it was bloody, and I think uh, politicians sort of look at that and say, boy, I don't want to get into that. Uh, and in fact, Joe Lieberman backed off his questions about affirmative action uh, after and as a result of that campaign. He said that was one reason he was backing off. My gosh, even Jesse Jackson's attacking me. I better rethink this. Other questions here? Um, yes, right here. This gentleman here in the front. Well, wait, wait till the microphone gets to you because otherwise we won't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> it's currently in Anacostia. It's working its way up the Southwest Freeway. There we go. Better than the Metro. Thanks. Um, I, I was actually just curious, and I apologize if this is um, very obvious to everybody in the room, but I don't understand it. so. Uh, I was wondering in the Defense of Marriage Act case, where does the bipartisan legal advisory group get the standing to essentially enforce a federal statute? I was just curious how it seems Not like to enforce, but to defend. Or to defend it in yeah. federal court. I, I 
think it's not a matter of them having standing per se, it's that they've been allowed to intervene. And this is something that, that courts do on a regular basis. I mean, for example, in the Supreme Court, you, you periodically come up with a case where the party that, that normally would be defending the case has chosen not to or is, is not choosing to advance as strong a defense as the court wants to see. They may be only willing to argue one part. And so the court will appoint an amicus in that case, not even someone else who wants to intervene and say, no, no, we actually have a position that we want to make sure this gets defended. Um, but but that the court will appoint someone. You saw the same thing in, in Proposition 8 because Governor Schwarzenegger and then Governor Brown said, we're not going to defend Prop 8. Um, and, then, and then they allowed interveners uh, who were the, the, the groups that had been advancing Proposition 8 in the first place to do that. So I think the court, our, our, our system is based on an adversary procedure, so the court wants to make sure we have the, the arguments fully. Plus it's uh, an act of Congress, right? So they have some, so they have well, some skin is, in yeah, the game, right? Con there's Congress a law. Does, there's a law. Doesn't, okay, there's great. a law that says that if the, federal, if the president is not going to defend a federal statute, the attorney general has to write a letter to the both houses of Congress saying, here's why I'm going to take the unusual step of not defending it. And that process is designed, then the, the houses of Congress have the right to come in and defend the statute that they passed. Uh, while you all are thinking of other questions, I want to ask you a, ca a question, Ken. You know, for a while after, uh, in the early days of the Bush administration, we saw all kinds of cases coming before the Supreme Court about the rights of detainees in Guantanamo Bay and how much they had a right to challenge the conditions of their confinement and how much the courts here had to entertain them. Now the Supreme Court seems to take no interest in these cases and is content to let the Court of Appeals kind of work out the limitations. Why do you think that's happening? I think for a couple reasons. One, the D.C. Circuit's doing a good job. I think they're, they're handling the cases well. And so I, even though uh, they're very controversial, the detainee cases are being uh, well addressed by, the, by a very uh, well-respected court. Um, you know, and then sort of as, as a general sort of historical matter, things are settling out after 9-11. I mean, you sort of see that after 9-11, just like after any uh, crisis, there's a reaction by government. The government puts things in place sort of quickly and some would argue haphazardly, but that's just the nature of crisis response. And a lot of new initiatives come about, they're challenged, and then I think what we've seen over the last 11 years is things have sort of settled out and stabilized, and there's more political consensus. If you just, you just look at what the Obama administration is doing right now, it's not that different in many ways in the national security sphere than what the Bush administration did throughout its, ministry, throughout its uh, two terms, but especially at the end. And given that there's that consensus, um, that's one of the reasons why national security is not an issue in the political campaign. Um, but I think it's also one of the reasons why we're, things are a little less litigious in the national security area. Thank you. This will be our last question. Yes, sir. Any predictions for retirements at the end of the term? I think a lot may depend on who the next president is. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think that, uh, that obviously we have several justices who are getting older, but I think most of them would feel that if they were voluntarily retiring and not forced to do so by, by health concerns or some other extenuating circumstance, that the sort of the honorable thing to do is seen as being retiring during the, uh, the term it, of the party that, that appointed you in the first place. So you could see Justice Ginsburg, now that she's accomplished, I think she was trying to, to make some kind of a record for how long she uh, sitting on the court, she will have accomplished that in, in 2014, I believe. So if, if President Obama's there, we may see Justice Ginsburg retire. You may see uh, Scalia or even Kennedy retire if we, if we have a President Romney. So, I mean, it makes a huge, it's, it makes it a huge potential shift in the court based on the next president. You could have uh, one, two, or even three additional nominees, uh, you know, not because of volunteer retirement, but if something else happened, that would give either President Obama the opportunity to appoint a majority of the members of the Supreme Court, but given his, his two previous nominations, or it would give uh, a President Romney the chance to possibly shift the balance. And any, anyone replacing Justice Kennedy would certainly affect the balance, make it e either as probably a solid liberal or solidly conservative court, to, assuming the president knows how to pick the right pr the person that they want, <laughs> which is always a challenge. You said retirements during this term. My prediction would be none. They all seem to be pretty healthy. Four years, I think they can all sit there and think, well, gee, it'd be great to have so-and-so replace me, but four years is a long time. We'll worry about that later. I'm having fun for now. Speaking of having fun, would you all join me on behalf of the Federalist Society in thanking our panelists?